Currently, I'm walking on the grounds of what used to be the Westdale Mall here in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Now, of course, it is long ago since it's been torn down. It's been almost 10 years now. And of course, like the Westdale Mall and lots of other malls around the country and the world, people just stop coming to them because the invention of the internet has changed the way we live, communicate, make money, and spend money. And you got Amazon, a very, very huge company. And a lot of us, instead of going to a mall like we did as kids in the 70s and the 80s, we just forgot about what once used to be the epicenter of almost culture in many ways. And for one 18-year-old Michelle Marico, the mall was the hub of where she would hang out with her friends. She would shop, just hang out young kid hanging out at the mall like many of us used to do. On December 19th, 1979, Michelle came to the Westdale Mall because she had a coat that she had been paying on layaway. She came to this mall and was brutally murdered. We're gonna tell you about her story and how her murderer was caught almost 40 years to the day that she was murdered. Let's get right into the story. Right across this grassy field is one J.C. Penny. This was once an anchor to the mall here where I'm standing. Christmas time in Cedar Rapids, 1979. And this place is gonna be a buzz. There's lots of people here Christmas shopping. Not too far from this location is the Sheraton Hotel. And there's a banquet party happening over there and there's lots of kids attending. And one of those kids is one 18 year old, Michelle. She's at this party with her friends and they're probably talking about what normal teenage girls talk about. And I'm pretty sure they're talking about school finally ending. It's a little ways away, but it's finally gonna come to an end and some of those kids are talking about what they're gonna do when they graduate. Some of them are going to Iowa State University. Some of them are going to the University of Iowa. Some are gonna be going to school outside of Iowa, leaving their friends and family behind. And after the party ends, Michelle has her eyes set on one thing and that is a winter jacket that she's had on layaway for quite some time. She's coming to the mall because she's gonna pick it up. Now, she doesn't wanna go alone. I mean, who wants to be seen at the mall by yourself? I mean, you know, you wanna be with a friend, you don't wanna go alone. So she asked one of her friends, hey, do you wanna come with me to the mall? And now the first friend, of course, says, you know, maybe they got prior engagements or what have you. So she declines the invite. Now, a second friend, at first they said, yeah, I'll go out with you. But then later they had a change of heart and they decided they didn't want to go. So it looks like Michelle's going to be going by herself to the mall. So she gets into the family's car, a 1972 Buick Electra, and she makes the uh, three or four mile journey from the hotel to this very mall. Michelle parks somewhere in this parking lot here at the mall. In her purse, she has about $180, enough to get the jacket and maybe buy a couple other things that she wants. So she goes into the mall and business as usual. About 9 p.m., somebody notices a cute blonde girl near a jewelry store. Not sure where the jewelry store is. It was somewhere out here. And that was the last person to see Michelle alive you fast forward to December 20th, 1979, it's 2 a.m. And Michelle hasn't came home yet. 
Now, I don't know if she has a curfew. She's a, technically an adult, but you're still living under mom and dad's roof. I imagine she does. And I imagine that her dad is getting pretty nervous. It's not like Michelle to be gone at all hours of the night. So he contacts the Cedar Rapids Police Department to report his daughter missing. They take the report and they, I'm sure, put out an APB giving her physical description and letting them know where she was last supposed to be at. You fast forward two hours later, a patrol unit comes to the mall and the mall at that time should be empty except for maybe you have three or four cars people here working overnight cleaning up the mall now they're looking for a 1972 buick electra and they see it in this parking lot as the patrol car comes up on the vehicle they step out of their car they shine their lights and inside the vehicle they see what looks to be the body of a young woman and in the interior of the vehicle is completely splattered with blood. Now, I imagine that the police that work in Cedar Rapids at that time are definitely not used to seeing a crime scene such as this. You gotta imagine he's yelling to her excuse me miss are you okay maybe he touches her maybe he doesn't i don't know but he immediately radios for a ambulance to come out here asap and now you're going to get the sirens coming paramedics arrive on the scene there's absolutely nothing they can do she's already dead and a scene that many of us probably never want to see ever in our lives so they put up the crime scene tape, protect the scene, and they're calling for the Lynn County Coroner's Office to come to pick her up. This appears to be a murder, and she's scheduled for autopsy later that morning. Now, during the autopsy, uh, it is counted that she was stabbed 29 times. Most of the wounds were in her chest, her neck, and her face. Can you imagine somebody with a knife? Or they're guessing it was a knife because they didn't have the murder weapon. A sharp instrument. Probably a knife. Could have been a nice pick. I don't know. But can you imagine somebody stabbing somebody in the face? I mean, it's very difficult for normal people to imagine stabbing somebody. This was a crime that whoever committed number one seems like they had a strong hatred for michelle her money was in the purse so this wasn't a robbery and this was not a sexual assault this was an act of pure and unadulterated aggression and rage we have a killer somewhere out in this city and the police they're working as hard as they can to come up with an answer to who is responsible for her murder and hundreds of people are interviewed all of her friends her family members they're trying to piece together uh her last known whereabouts what she did before that uh was this a a jealous person they're just trying to come up with some kind of answer as to why somebody would do this. Now, they did have a suspect originally. Some guy in the area had raped a woman by a knife point. So I'm imagining that they probably thought that it was that person. But uh, come to find out, uh, possibly where they were at was their alibi. So they're, you know, excluded from, you know, being a potential uh, suspect. Now we do have DNA technology, kinda, kinda sorta, not really. And the only evidence they have that they can keep for storage until 
this uh, case can possibly solved at a later date and time is they have her dress but they don't have any fingerprints no fingerprints no murder weapon none of her friends had any kind of jealous rage towards her. nothing like that she had no enemies I mean I'm sure other girls at school might have been jealous of her you know you always have those they're always around but nobody that she knew wanted her dead and this was like I said not a sexual assault so who the hell would approach an 18 year old girl and for what seems like absolutely no reason no robbery nothing like that who in the hell would stab her with such anger sadly it is a uh, case that would go unsolved for almost 40 years michelle's case would quickly grow cold in the ensuing years and just like many unsolved murders the hundreds and thousands throughout the decades and centuries across this nation tired eyes working on a case they put the folder in the back and then they start working on the unfortunate new victims of homicide coming to their offices and the years would go by people don't remember really anymore what happened now some do and some come out of the woodwork just to give faulty information on something that they might have thought they seen that night they're not really sure and oftentimes they lead detectives in kind of this uh, ensuing uh, circle where they end up at the same position where they once started people don't mean to do that but it oftentimes happens and the detectives on that case retire and then you get some new fresh eyes to come into the Cedar Rapids Police Department. Maybe they can see something that a detective that's been hardened for 30 years didn't. So in 2006, that's exactly what happened. A detective working the cold case unit for the Cedar Rapids Police Department opens up Michelle's file. He goes through the evidence and they discover a small blood stain on that dress that they previously did not see now we have dna technology but we still don't have any hits because they submitted it into the codis system nothing so obviously whoever the murderer is either has not submitted their own dna into a dna database or they were never arrested. So you fast forward about a decade. So in 2017, a company was hired to produce, I don't know what word to use, to produce a likely image of what the killer possibly looked like so they can make a uh, digital flyer to make a press conference about it. So this picture was put out and you still really have nothing however you do have the technology called familial dna where now it is possible to go through your fam your family's lineage to perhaps find michelle's killer 2018 the police department hires a uh, genealogy company to submit the dna to possibly see if anybody has, you know, put in their DNA in hopes of finding a long lost cousin or a brother, what have you. So all of a sudden they get a hit. Now it's not an exact hit, but it's a hit on the uh, DNA, I guess profile you'll call it, of a woman that lives here in Iowa. Now they figure the DNA from this hit is from a second cousin twice removed. Now, I'd be lying to you if I said I knew exactly how it works, but 
oftentimes when I think about stories like this, I look at that tree and all the branches and then you kind of go down past the trunk into the roots and the ground. And that's basically in a nutshell, without boring you to tears, how they go about developing the profile. And I don't know how long it takes, but I'm pretty sure it's somewhat painstaking, but they get to work and they discover that the killer from that unknown female's DNA that they're related to is one of three possible brothers that live in Iowa with the last name of Burns. We know now that one of these three guys is the killer. We just don't know which one. We got to get the DNA from them somehow in some which way. Now, I'm assuming that if you know one of the three men is responsible now, you got to get the DNA. So they probably dug through their trash or followed them. They were able to get the three DNA samples because you just can't go up to a brother and say, hey, we don't have a court order, but can you give us your DNA? They could have done that. I didn't see it online, but who knows? But eventually they get the three DNA samples from the brothers. Now, one sample that they got with, that was an exact match was of one, I think he was either 68 or 69 years of age at the time, Jerry Lynn Burns. Jerry lived about 35, 40 miles north of here. He was the owner of a small powder coating business. I guess they were following him and he was drinking out of a cup and he threw it in the trash and they grabbed the straw and they swabbed it for the DNA and it was an exact hit. So they go to the court to get a search warrant to get his DNA. So they go to his business and they sit down and talk to him. And they ask him, hey, do you know about the Michelle Martico murder? And he says, yeah, of course. And they asked him, well, did you know her? And he said, no, not at all. But of course I know about the story because it was big news down in Cedar Rapids. So they proceed to ask him where he was on the night of December 19th, 1979. And then they start uh, cutting to the chase. They tell him that they have a sample of his DNA and it's an exact match. So they ask him, if we swab your mouth, is it going to be the same exact match? And he's, first he declines to submit to the mouth swab. But they got a court order. So they tell him, they say, you don't really got a choice. We're going to get your DNA either the easy way or we're going to do this a hard way. So what do you want to do? He doesn't have a choice. They swab his mouth. Now, they got a couple units hanging out outside of his business. He ain't going anywhere. As soon as they get a hit, they're going to come back and gaffle him up. And I, I want to say the same day, don't quote me, possibly the same day. It was very quick. It was a hit. It was an exact match. They come, tell him, put your hands behind your back. You're under arrest for the murder of 18-year-old Michelle Martico. He was arrested exactly the same day. 39 years to the day of that murder. So he's quickly taken to the jail where he sits for the better part of the next, I want to say, two years. And eventually he goes to trial. His lawyers try to argue that possibly the DNA was some, there was some kind of cross contamination. However, Jerry Lynn Burns said that he didn't know Michelle. He had never seen her in his life. So that kind of throws out their theory because obviously he had close contact with her. So you're telling us you've never seen her in your life, but your DNA, your blood was on her dress. Michelle is buried next to her parents, Albert and Janet, 
right here. And sadly, they both died without ever knowing who murdered their daughter. Currently, that bastard is serving a life sentence at a prison in Atamosa. He is never ever getting out unless it's being carried out in a box. Why did he murder her? I have no clue. It was weird, him and his interaction with the detectives, he never admitted it, but he didn't outright deny it. And one of his cellmates had testified in court that he had made a joke after I believe losing in a card game or something along those lines about, I'm gonna have to take you to the mall. Even though him and his defense attorneys denied it a DNA expert who was the witness for the prosecution said that the chances of another profile out in the world being an exact match be it a possible second killer another killer with the same DNA one in 100 billion would it be one in 100 billion It took 39 years, but finally the killer was caught. Rest in peace. Okay, guys. I am out of here. I will catch up with you on the next vlog. Peace out.